Today in Living Football, Nuno Gomes, the Portuguese star striker, talks about his biggest career highlights, talent development in his home country and the future of football. Arsene Wenger gives exclusive insights into the FIFA Global Report and we show how the COVID-19 relief plan helped Barbados to keep their dreams alive. A warm welcome to another episode of Living Football from the home of FIFA in Zurich, Switzerland. We're glad you're joining us. He is regarded one of the country's most recognizable attacking players of all time. Played alongside Luis Figo and Cristiano Ronaldo, participated in two FIFA World Cups and represented Portugal at every level, earning 143 caps. We are delighted he is joining us here in the studio in Zurich today. A warm welcome to Nuno Gomes. Thank you. Thank I'm you. very happy and glad to be, to be here. Thank you so much for being with us. We are here at the home of FIFA in Switzerland. So if you think back to the two FIFA World Cups in which you participated, what would you describe as the most memorable moments? Well, uh, I think, I think the, the fact that I, I was participating in a World Cup uh, for that reason is already a, a memorable, memorable moment because since I, my childhood uh, I used to watch on, on TV all the all the the big competitions and the World Cup, so uh, I always dreamed to 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 be part of it. So you took part in 2002, and then 2006. 2006. And during the I think during the World Cup qualifying stage, you were often injured, but you came back and you scored in the match for third place against Germany. And we I think we have that goal here. Take a look. Mm. It was a brilliant yes. header. Yes. So, can nice. you describe this atmosphere back then in Stuttgart? Nice, uh, nice assist from Figo. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it was it was a, a great atmosphere. Although uh, for Germany, um, they were organizing the World Cup, and of course, they they had the expectations to to go to the final. So 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 the West Portuguese team we lost the semi final against France, um, but this game uh, we lost uh, that game. I have uh, I have the memory that I was the, the last player to score a goal to Oliver Kahn because he he, he decided True. he decided to to um, to leave football after after that uh, World Cup. But I remember that the atmosphere was um, was amazing, uh, even though we were playing for third and fourth place. And uh, at halftime was 0-0, but uh, the second half, uh, Schweinsteiger didn't didn't give us uh, a chance because he scored twice in on a row, uh, and with a lot of um, fans from Germany in the stands. It was uh, quite difficult for us to 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 win that game. You played alongside all these great players. I mean, we've already mentioned some, but one, of course, is still playing, who is Cristiano Ronaldo. And we we just know the player. I mean, you know the person. What is it like to be <laughs> in a team with him? Well, at, at that time, uh, he arrived uh, before the Euro 2004. So he, he was 18, but we we suddenly saw um, that he was different from the other players uh, in terms of uh, his personality, um, not only inside inside the, the pitch or the way he was uh, always trying to be the best uh, in the pitch, but uh, also outside. He he, he had uh, an amazing. Uh, will of uh, become uh, the best um, and he was working every day uh, harder to improve his, uh, uh, his skills and uh, we suddenly realized that we are uh, in front of a special uh, player and person. Uh, of course, 
maybe I wouldn't imagine that he will become uh, one of the greatest of, of, all time, of all times. So FIFA recently published a study on the global talent development with the headline, Give Every Talent a Chance. How did it all start for you and when did you get your chance? It all starts in the streets <laughs> with, uh, with my neighbors. Uh, every, uh, every minute I had, uh, I was with the ball, uh, always beside me. So every, every place that we, we could play, we, we were playing. With, uh, I was playing with my friends, with my colleagues in, in school. Um, it starts like that, as a passion uh, for a ball and, and, and for the game. And then it becomes serious. Uh, uh, in my hometown, Amarant, um, all the summers we 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 participating in some tournaments, uh, and it started like that to become more seriously. And after I went to I went to my hometown club, and uh, it all started like that. Nuno got his chance, and he used it. And this. FIFA Global report, this 14-month study is very interesting. It analyzed youth football and talent development structures all around the world. So let's hear what FIFA President Gianni Infantino had to say about it at the 71st FIFA Congress. First action here, which has already been kicked off, is called Give Every Talent a Chance. Arsene Wenger and his team have gathered data from all member associations. More than 20,000 pages of data. And they are elaborating a tailor-made concept for each country on how best to operate, to give every talent in the country a chance to play. So as FIFA President Gianni Infantino says, the global report was initiated by FIFA's Chief of Global Football Development, Arsene Wenger, who's joining us here now. Thank you very much for being with us again, Arsene. Thank you. Good afternoon. When you got the data after this 14-month this research, was there any surprise for you? Yes, of course, it was a big surprise. It's a quantity of work that has been done and I asked uh, my team to do and that they did gre uh, greatly. And uh, we analyzed uh, 205 countries, the needs, the strengths and the weaknesses. And uh, we made two reports, one global report mm -hmm. and one uh, individual report that each country will get. So you can imagine the amount of work that is behind that. The first problem in the countries is identification of talent. You must know who is uh, some talent and who has no talent at all. And after that, it is a, a written program to develop the players. What not many countries have, you know, on mm -hmm. our, in our statements, we, say, we see that, that you have a plan to develop the different parts that the player needs to develop. Because it's important to do the right things at the right age. And after that, of course, it's as well, uh, uh, get the best together, you know because uh, of the stimulation. Uh, the good players have to play with the good players. And uh, I would say on the former studies I made a long time ago, we realized that small countries like Portugal or like Holland, for example, mm -hmm. they have created great players. For one reason is the number of good players by square kilometers is bigger than in a bigger country. You know? And good players on a short distance play against each other and stimulate each other and develop each other. So that is one message we want to give out as well to the countries we have analyzed, even if we had not millions to organize competitions, but you can regroup the best and give them a good education. I think there is an emotional moment, you know, in, in the development of young players. When you worked at the Benfica Academy, you... you developed young players, for example, Renato Sanchez, who now is now playing for the national team, Rubias, Bernardo Silva, Andre Gomez, many, many more. Can you describe this special moment, or is there a special moment when you have this sensation, okay, this player might be going to make a difference? Well, uh, uh, it's, it, I could answer in different, uh, different answers. I think, it's, um, first of all, 
uh, when you see the player and his relationship with the ball, <laughs> you, you get to know uh, that uh, this player is different than the others, for example. And then it comes the, the relationship with the colleagues, uh, the way he understands the game. But, for example, you mentioned Renato Sanchez, uh, and in a space of one season, uh, I saw him play in under-18, and then he went to under-19 youth, uh, mm -hmm. youth league team, and then he played in the B team, and then he started in the first team, and at the end of that season, he went to do the Euro 2016 and he played in the national team in a space of, I don't know, 10 months. So to develop a player yes. is like to build a house. <laughs> it is like to build a house, but it starts the first row, as I told you, is the technique. Yes. You know? That means uh, that basically you need to make of the ball your friend. That means no matter where he comes from, he's welcome, you know and that you treat him like a real friend. That means uh, uh, that you master every aspect of uh, controlling the ball. And uh, that is decided before the age of 12. And then comes the second floor, which is? Then comes uh, the physical level. You don't know uh, between 12 and 16 how the player develops. Is he quick enough? Uh, has he enough stamina? Uh, is he explosive or not in a position where he plays? Mm -hmm. And uh, after that comes uh, at 16, around 15, 16, the real specialization of the position, you know. Before that, you move them a little bit around to see where they are well positioned. And then at 16, 17, starts a specialization. Then uh, you know the guy will be a striker, a midfielder, a defender. And uh, after that, uh, like Nuno uh, said that, uh, it comes an important part. How do you understand uh, at the start, when you work technique, it's me and the ball. After, it's me, the ball and my partners. Can I make a good pass? Mm -hmm. After it gets me, the ball, my partner and the opponents. Do we understand where to be, what they do? Do I understand quickly how to, what is going on a football pitch? And then, uh, like we said, the roof of a house is a mental. Because he said for Renato Sanchez, how much you want to be to become a professional footballer? Yes. But essential for the development of young players are also definitely the youth national teams. You for earned sure. 64 caps in the youth national teams. So how did that help you to develop into the player you became? It helped me a lot to have to have those kind of competition and to to participate in that kind of environment, to play among the best players in, in, in Portugal yes. from my generation, it, it helped me to get better because uh, I realized that uh, um, I was playing with the, with the bet, best players uh, of the country. So I, I had to work harder to become even, even better. So to play and to, to, to be able to participate in, in the youth uh, career in the national team from the age of under 15 until under 21. Uh, I think it's one, one of the important uh, um, best things that happened to me for, for my career uh, because it gave me also the, the, the break, background that I needed to, to, to play at, at the highest level. So it's like Arsene said, bringing the best players together. In 1995, you played in the Under-20 World Cup um, in Qatar. Qatar, exactly. I well, think you finished next third. Year, so there will be the World Cup there. Yes, but how did that influence your career? Uh, is again to play to play among um, among and against the, the the best players in the world of of that generation. Um, it gave, gave me a, a, a measure of where, where I was, my standard. So, uh, and he gave me also confident, uh, confidence to, to, get, uh, to get better, to improve, uh, and to play against uh, the best players in the world. So um, FIFA's youth competitions are also play a significant role in motivating young players. FIFA president Gianni Infantino also commented on that in his speech. We know that if we keep the tournaments every two years, every second year, many talents are getting lost. 
A 17-year-old boy in a country has five times more chances to participate in the World Cup than a 16-year-old, just because the World Cup happens to be in that particular year. So we need to see if we want to play our youth competitions yearly or every two years. So I said five times more chances seems a little bit unfair. What can we do? It's a big responsibility and I think uh, I would like to thank FIFA for having taken that educational responsibility really uh, by uh, uh, the scrap of the neck and try to do something about it because I, I believe uh, that uh, we are a little bit uh, not seeing the reality of the world by living in Europe. Europe is structured, yeah. well educated, good development programs, they do all well and we have to congratulate them for that. But after that, you have still 160 countries in the world yeah. who have uh, children who uh, want to play football. And uh, that's what we have to develop, you know. And uh, some countries, uh, like Japan, uh, do well, but you have many countries in Africa who have not a good development program. And uh, where a child was born has no chance to play, you know. And I find that sad. And that's why we called our program Every uh, Talent a Chance, you know. It's not only to become a star just to have the luck to play football, to share emotions with friends, like Nuno said he played in the streets, he was happy in the street, don't worry. And, uh, mm, uh, but uh, it is a chance to play football. But wouldn't it also be important to have an annual FIFA youth competition then? So that every player gets the chance? One of the, of the, there's two aspects in uh, education. One of them is uh, training sessions, education with good coaches, and taking care of the development of the players. And the second aspect is the competitions. And uh, FIFA is an organizer of competitions. And uh, to give more boys a chance, yes, we should organize uh, under 17 World Cup every year. So what's your opinion on yes, that? Yes, I, I agree. It's, it's a little bit unfair uh, if you don't have your year the of luck, birth, you the know, luck determines. of your year of birth. Uh, to correspond in a, in a year of a World Cup, you miss the chance to, to play in, a, in, in the biggest competition in, uh, in the world in terms of, uh, of youth. So I think it's a good idea to give, again, every player a chance to participate at least once uh, in, a, in a World competition like, that, like and this. Definitely. And wouldn't that also fit in into FIFA's main objective to increase global competitiveness? Yes, of course. It's because you need youth development for that. We need youth development. And I would say as well, if the countries know that they go to the World Cup every year, they will make do more about the developing their players. You know, the federations will say, let's take charge of uh, educating players and uh, prepare the World Cup every year. Uh, that contributes to give every boy a chance or every girl. But when a young coach comes to you, and says, Arsene Wenger, please tell me, how can I become a successful coach? How can I become a great coach? Whatever. What would you answer? Well, I, I think uh, Nuno summarized well that behind uh, the technical aspect, you have love, you know. You, yes. you, uh, you need to love the players. You need to, uh, I would say, a coach is a guide. And what is a player? is somebody who need to meet his needs in a team, you know. And uh, exactly. that sometimes exactly. uh, there can be a, collide, a collision in a team because the players think, I don't like that because I, I cannot express myself. So the player has to, op the coach has to observe well mm -hmm. and to guide the players and have communication. I would say the, uh, most of the time, I personally believe that the coaches underestimate uh, not only the importance of a communication, but the quality of a communication, mm. you know. The quality of a communication is something that is very important. I was many times surprised when you speak to a player, he goes out of your office and you think what you have told him and what he understands yeah. is not always the same. <laughs> yes. Know? 
Yes, it's true. He laughs it's true. because he no, knows true. in the dressing room we yeah. talk after. <laughs> and uh, so the quality of the communication is something that is absolutely vital. But how do you increase the quality of communication? By uh, making sure, first, uh, I think you have uh, uh, to open the player when you meet him, you know, and uh, to let him express his feelings first. After, you have not to close his mind too strictly. I always thought I gave him two or three positive things that I like with him and one thing I have prepared where he can work on, you know. So you open his receptivity mm -hmm. and you give him as well a target the where he system. can uh, improve. And you make sure that you understand, that you're on the same wavelengths. And uh, believe me, even in a modern game, it's so important to have that quality of communication in every organization, you know, because uh, uh, what you want to create is a culture of performance inside the team. And for that culture of performance, it's important that the players are on board with you. But you have to be reliable for that. I think reliability is so important because confidence comes with trust. And confidence is basically important to perform. Confidence is trust, because what is, what is a coach? He says to a group of people, we want to do this together, and I trust you, you can exactly. do it. Exactly. Transparency, no? Tra you know? Also transparency. I believe in you, you can do it, you know? Yeah. But uh, some people don't experience that well. No. They feel that uh, they can become paranoid because uh, they see enemies everywhere, and some yeah. can do that, you know? So it is very important that you can trust people, and as well, that you see in every player, there is not one player in the world who has absolutely every quality. But you make your life and your career with one dominant quality, exactly. you know. And you have to identify that quality that makes the player special and encourage him to use that well. Nuno, let's also speak about numbers. While the global transfers in 2019 generated over $7 billion, only $70 million in training compensation were paid to the clubs. There is obviously something wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and I believe that, well, uh, uh, it's like the richer, the richer is getting richer and the poor is getting poorer. But uh, I believe that uh, uh, there's need for a change. Um, and I think uh, it's not fair, uh, especially for those clubs that sometimes uh, are investing in developed players, uh, then uh, they don't get the, the, the rewards that they deserve. So I think is, um, we need transparency and you need to regulate uh, those kinds of, uh, of situations in order to um, to get more transparency and to get more uh, payments in solidarity, for example. So, would you also think that for FIFA, for example, has now submitted the third package of the transfer reform? This transparency, isn't it also important for, for young players and for their career? Yes, I think transparency in, in what it concerns to football is important uh, is one of the, the biggest important things, transparency. And, and uh, that kind of situation has to be clear from the beginning. And I think it's important not only for the, the young players, but also for, for example, uh, the loan players, the rules of the loan players, the, the rules of, uh, of how agents uh, are, are working. So it's important for, for everybody to, to, to give uh, an example also to, to other areas of uh, society. Um, how can we uh, work uh, with transparency and with everything clear without uh, any, any suspicions? No, no, last question. You played 463 league games, scoring 158 goals. Who is the person who influenced you the most throughout your career? Well... Uh, I will say, I have to say, of course, and it's fair enough to say, I have to say my parents first, because they always encourage me to, to, to play. And well, they encourage me, uh, but uh, in a certain point, they, 
they help me to achieve uh, my dream. Uh, but of course, uh, I have, uh, uh, when I was a kid, I was, you, you used to work here, Marco Van Basten, for example, I, I used to love him, uh, watch him to, to, score, to score some goals. Um, so, uh, looking at uh, uh, the big competitions on, on television, I, I always dreamed to be to become a, a professional footballer. So, uh, in every step of my career, I had people that influenced mm, to, to and helped me to, to achieve. But most of most of them, the coaches and uh, and uh, my colleagues of uh, of the of the team. Nuno, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for thank being you. with us here in Zurich. Arsene? It was an honor. Thank you very much. Please thank come. you, Nuno. Thank you, I think his example is a great example to follow, you know, yes. because uh, uh, he's shown us through his career. But uh, he didn't tell us how long he played, you know, yeah. because he played until the age of uh, 36. Yeah, 36. So that means, you know, 15 years at the top level, people don't realize what that means. And that means behind that is a huge passion. Yeah. And the huge mental strength. Thank you very much, Arsene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So, speaking about increasing global competitiveness, well, the COVID-19 pandemic left its mark everywhere last year, but FIFA was quick to respond by setting up a COVID-19 relief fund of $1.5 billion to help its 211 member associations. In Barbados, for example, this support made it possible to keep football alive. The support from the COVID-19 relief plan was amazing for us. Without it, um, we wouldn't be able to c compete. Uh, we wouldn't be able to have our camps, our training. So it's fundamental for us to continue our preparation towards the World Cup qualifying. With this COVID-19 relief plan, we're back out there, we're training, we're working, we're preparing. And hopefully this is going to give some of these young players the opportunity to be in the shop window, to be seen, to change their lives. FIFA's COVID-19 relief plan is helping us to keep doing what we love and keeping Barbados football's future alive. This is the first time in memory that uh, there was no football action in Barbados. FIFA, in its attitude, assisted us greatly with the COVID funds. We were able to assist our players by giving them stipends for the first time for being selected in the national team. The pandemic hit football in a major way because it came to a complete standstill. Um, it was heartbreaking to be honest. The team is very happy to know that we have the backing of some of the president and FIFA to actually get us back out on the field. I don't even want to think about not training and not competing really. I know it's difficult times with COVID. I'm just delighted that, uh, that we're back and these young men are back on the football pitch. Our FIFA Forward Funds was used to enhance the facility here at Wildey. The vision of the Barbados Football Association is to use these funds to have a proper facility that can be recognized globally. We expect that at the end of the development of the facility, that we will become more self-sufficient. What I would really like uh, for us uh, is to qualify for a major tournament. And I think it definitely change a lot of lives. I have a vision and a dream for the success of football in Barbados. We must have strong programs for youth, and that includes men and women. And also, uh, we need to, to ensure that our technical programs are very well run. We look forward with the continued assistance of CONCACAF and FIFA uh, to really give it a go. 
This project is just one of many. In our forthcoming episodes, we continue to showcase some of the myriad projects that FIFA and the FIFA Foundation are developing, supporting and funding all around the world. That's all we have time for in this episode. Next time, we will speak about the upcoming Olympic FIFA football tournaments and we are pleased to introduce the first female Secretary General in FIFA's 117-year history, Fatma Samura. So stay healthy and goodbye.